That's what's happening. All right, well, good morning. It's good, morning. good to... Be back here at Heritage, and I checked my calendar uh, yesterday. I was in the office doing some studying, and I checked my calendar. We were here back on the uh, 7th of February, uh, 2016, to be exact. And so that was uh, about two and a half years ago. And uh, we had just returned back from America on December 2015, so about three months before that. And so we were just getting our feet grounded uh, there at New Beginnings in Mango Hill. And uh, so we've been there now, of course, the last two and a half years. And like Pastor mentioned, we'll uh, give you a bit more of an update what's happening with the ministry in the, uh, in the, next, uh, the next service. But this being uh, Missions Emphasis Sunday. And so this is uh, emphasizing missions. Now, who uh, is this more of an open forum type of time? You can do it. Okay, whatever. I can dance, I can, I can sing, do, do whatever. Okay. Dance, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I won't do that. <laughs> I'm not very good at it. So. That's it, yeah, yeah. But uh, who, uh, who here can, can tell me, basically, in a nutshell, what, what the mission is of us individually than of the church? We talk about missions emphasis Sunday. So, what exactly are we speaking of when we say that missions? Emphasis. Bringing the word of God to the people. Exactly, yeah. Bringing the word of God to the people. Proclaiming the name of Christ. You see in the book of Acts, uh, the name of Jesus Christ was uh, constantly being proclaimed. And it's the name of Christ that will change people. It's not religion. It's not anything else. It's the name of Jesus Christ. So this, this uh, particular morning, I guess, we're, uh, we're going to emphasize uh, missions in and proclaim the name of Christ and uh, different things that, uh, and look, it's not a familiar, it's not a, uh, I should say, not an unfamiliar topic. I'm sure you're very familiar with missions and, you know, what we need to do and the Great Commission there in Matthew 28, 19 through 20. It's not an uh, unfamiliar topic whatsoever. Um, we're very, if you've been saved any length of time, in fact, it's because you are saved. The missions is because you're saved. Somebody came to you with the gospel, you heard the gospel. And so we're all here this morning because of missions. Right. And so uh, we need to take that what's happened to us and share with others around us. Right. And so it's, we, it's, not, it's not a very you know, uh, unfamiliar topic. And uh, sometimes with that, with being familiar with a certain topic, we kind of, you know, oh, I, I heard that before. I know that already. And so let me encourage you to, to uh, you know, not do that. And we, have, as a, even myself, have a tendency to do that. I've heard that before. And, and so let's turn to Acts chapter 13, if you would, this morning in the, in the Sunday school. You call it Sunday school or life class, whatever. It's, it's a Bible class. Yeah. All right. Acts 13 here. And uh, I guess this thought has uh, borne itself out of uh, a recent uh, situation I've uh, encountered uh, last couple of days, in fact, um, here in Acts 13. Morning, guys. Morning. Jeffrey, right? That's it, yeah, I've seen you in a long time. Yeah, man, I'll tell you what. Whew, can't forget that face. <laughs> you better stay back there, bro. You just gotta take out of Frank. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, Acts 13. Uh, Acts number 13, and uh, we're gonna look at uh, a few verses here, and this is the start of the... Uh, the first missionary journey of Apostle Paul, and if you're familiar with the Apostle Paul at all, you understand he's, uh, he took three missionary journeys. If you have a Bible with maps in the back, uh, more often than not, you'll find uh, several maps of his journeys, and you can see where he uh, took off from and where he went and all that. But here is the beginning parts of uh, his first missionary journey in Acts 13. And uh, like I mentioned, this uh, has really borne out of some issues that I've been dealing with recently uh, out west. And uh, understand when we think about missions in any time, regardless if it's missions or serving the Lord in any capacity, understand that when you serve the Lord, you're going to face opposition. Because you have a, an enemy called the devil that he wants to uh, inhibit and prohibit what you're doing. He doesn't want the gospel going forward. He wants to stop the word of the Lord from going forward. And that's been the case through all history. All right, starting in the Garden of Eden, he tried, he de deceived Adam and Eve. And uh, so it, throughout all history, and it will be until the end time, until Christ comes back, yeah. we're going to face opposition. We're going to face pressure. And so it's nothing new. Uh, and sometimes it can be overwhelming. It can be a bit uh, like you're in a pressure cooker. Like mm -hmm. things, things are going to explode and, 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 and steam out and blow up. And sometimes you feel that pressure and, and it's, we have to understand it's not abnormal. It will happen. 
And so here in Acts 13, let's read a few verses in verse number 1. And uh, we'll see here what's taking place. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed from Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had also John to the minister. And when they had gone through the island of Antipaphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Elimaeus the sorcerer, for so was his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then a deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. Then they go on from there uh, to another place there on their journey. But here, straight away, this is Paul's first missionary journey, his first few days of his journey, and he's encountering opposition. I mean, right off the bat, right from the word go, he's facing some pressure from opposition from the enemy. In fact, a, a fellow that was a sorcerer, I mean, the, close to the devil himself, <laughs> preached, you know, practiced in, in witchcraft. So here, Paul immediately found this and found this precious opposition now understand acts here is a missionary book what time do we usually finish up 10 o'clock okay so acts here is a missionary book and uh it's the spreading of the propagation of the gospel and here we have reached a milestone here in, in acts 13 and this is the first uh real uh, beachhead in the pagan world a gentile world that is and uh and so they are uh, it's been about 25 years since pentecost and the church has grown and flourished and and uh, it's time to move into the Gentile world. And we see this church at Antioch. It's a very strong church. It, it was uh, characterized by several things. It had a strong doctrinal basis. Uh, there's many gifted men and women there in this church. And the foundation has been laid. And it was a blueprint church, a model church, and a, a church to be to patterned after. It was a spirit-filled, empowered church. And, and by the way, that, that's a real key to... Uh, Anything we do for the Lord is to be spirit-empowered and to be spirit-filled to go out and, and, and take the supernatural seed that we have. You know, understand, these things were covered this morning briefly. It, 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 we're dealing in the spiritual world. It, it's, it's not a battle physically. It's a spiritual battle we, we, we can't see. And so here we have um, a spirit-empowered, a spirit-energized church. They knew the meaning of Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And they were about to go out and to reach the uttermost parts of their known world. You say, what, in fact, is a spirit-filled church? You can define it as this. A church where the members walk in consistent obedience to the will of God. Amen. Consistently obeying what God's will is for their life and the life of the church. And the will of God is found in the word of God. So briefly, let's, let's just go through a few of these things here that I found in, in, in this uh, in this passage, and, and uh, when we think about, you know, a church that will reach the world will be characterized in what fashion, in what way? Here, number one, I see, um, first of all, here this morning, we, we see a couple of things. Uh, this church was characterized by spiritual men, by spiritual men. Any church that is effective has to have the right leadership, the right leadership. And in fact, uh, the opposite of this in 1 Corinthians uh, Paul says the church at Corinth was in chaos because of lack 
of spiritual leadership. And so uh, this church here, we, we, we read there in the first uh, verse, we have Barnabas, Simeon, Lucius, Menaean, and Saul. All right, they were leaders of that church there. They were men that were leaders. Barnabas, of course, we, we are familiar with him. Uh, he was a Levite from Cyprus. And in chapter 11, the Bible said that he was filled with the Holy Ghost. He was a man that loved the Lord, that obeyed the Lord, that was filled with the Holy Ghost. And he was a Jew trained in the Old Testament, and he was a comforter, which his name means. And, and uh, he really balanced Paul out, I think, because Paul was not much of a comforter. He was a, uh, uh, a go-getter, just get out there and get it done. So you have Barnabas with him balancing that out. And so it works really nice that way. And so we, then we have Simeon. Uh, uh, Simeon, is, uh, his main name's black. He, he, was, uh, he was a Gentile. And understand that uh, there's no race distinction in, in the work of God. Amen. You know, any, any, anybody can be uh, saved. And, and join uh, the family of God and, and serve the Lord. Uh, again, Lucius, also from Africa, a Gentile. Menaean, he was brought up with Herod in the family of Agrippa. And then Saul, of course, he was the key man to pagan world evangelization. So we have a really strong core men here that were characterized by their spirituality. In fact, we, we know Paul wrote the, uh, the qualifications of leadership there in Titus 1 and, and, and uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3. And then uh, I'll read a few verses here in uh, chapter 6 of Acts. Kind of give a bit of a background on these fellows. Acts chapter 6. And uh, verse uh, number 3. And uh, it says here, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. All right. Look, at th these are criteria for picking the leaders of the church. You know, it's not, it's not what they wore. And, uh, it, you know, it, it, it's, it's, <laughs> look, it's simply, it's foundational principles, Bible principles of character. They were honest people. They were full of the Holy Ghost. They had wisdom. God blessed them with this. And then uh, verse 5, And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. Verse number 8, And Stephen, full of faith and power. Are these guys who were just, uh, they were filled with, and directed by the Holy Ghost. Yeah. And a church is going to reach out. It's going to have to be characterized by spiritual men and ladies and children. People that uh, want to obey and be directed by the power of the Holy Spirit. We have verse number two here. Uh, another thing I see about the um, a church that will reach the world is a church engaged in spiritual ministry. And this church, as, uh, as they ministered to the Lord, all right, these guys were busy. They were serving the Lord there at Antioch, and uh, they were busy ministering the word, this, the uh, dissemination of his word in prayer. And, uh, you know, back in Acts chapter 6, verse 4, we understand, uh, I won't time, uh, take time to read that this morning, but it's, it said that, uh, you know, they were uh, preaching and teaching, ministering the word of God. They were, they were praying. They were uh, studying disseminating God's word and helping the people grow. And it was a church that was busy in ministering and, and serving the Lord. It wasn't just activity. It was simply, it, it was, uh, you know, it, it was ministry that had a purpose of growing people. I understand Paul's, his life and his heart was to see people grow in the Lord. That's right. And I understand when a person gets saved, it's not the, the end, it's the beginning of a journey. Right. And so we have to be under, we have to be under the, uh, uh, direction and guidance of the Holy Spirit said, Lord, you know, this person needs to grow in this area and they need to grow in the knowledge and understanding and wisdom of you. So this, this church here was, was busy and they were engaged in spiritual ministry. Then I see, uh, another thing I see here is the fact that uh, it was a spiritual mission. A spiritual mission. And they were called, as we know there in verse number two, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted. The Holy Ghost said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. So of those five, the Holy Ghost said, separate me, these two guys, the cream of the crop, Saul and Barnabas, and I have a special calling for them. And I'm going to send them out on a journey. Now understand, when they were sent out, they didn't have vehicles and land cruisers. And uh, it was a totally different uh, scenario back then. It was on foot. It was camels, horses. And uh, at their journey, if you, see, you can see those maps in your Bible, you, you see where they went. And uh, it, was, it was hard work just to survive, right. just a day-by-day -day living, 
So, and we live in comfort today, you know, I mean, I, I got a, you know, a land cruiser, we, we do camp out in tents, but we have, you know, there's motels available today, mm -hmm. and nothing like that back in these days. And so it, it was a, a special calling that God called these two fellas, uh, Saul and Barnabas, and it was a spiritual mission, a spiritual mission. And there was a great responsibility and a great joy for this church to have these two fellows being sent out on this mission journey. And I love, I love, you know, sometimes we get so caught up in pragmatics, don't we? And I love this, how this church was behind them. And when they had fasted, the second time is that, that word is mentioned in, in these verses, they fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them and sent them away. All right. It, it was, it was, <laughs> it was, you know, the foundational things of Christianity. They, they, they prayed, they fasted, laid their hands on them saying, we confirm you. We understand we're behind you on this. It wasn't a healing service at all. It was simply laying hands and guys, we, we understand what God called you to do and we're behind you 100%. And we'll be here supporting you and praying for you. And uh, there, of course, they have uh, John, Mark as their helper there in the verse 5. And they had also John to the minister. All right, can I see a little bit of background there, what was taking place? And then when they were at Salamis, that's the port city. So they want, they, uh, they uh, sorry, depart from unto, unto Seleucia. And when uh, they're at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had also John to their minister. All right, so Seleucia was the port of Antioch. So they left from there. And uh, then they uh, sailed there to Cyprus. That was the home of Barnabas. So, so he uh, no doubt saw some family when he was there um, as they started their journey. And then John Mark, obviously, uh, he had uh, back in Acts chapter 12, they started some Bible studies in his home. So he's a fellow that was saved and he went along on this journey. So three fellows there on a spiritual mission. Then I see what I, what I call spiritual militants. And then once they... Uh, they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had also Jonathan the minister. And when they had gone through the island of Paphos, all right, so there's an island there they sailed to from, uh, from Seleucia, all right, the port city. They sailed over to this island, and then uh, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus, all right? So Bar-Jesus, his name means son of salvation. Interesting, son of salvation, all right? And uh, Paphos was the seat of Roman government. It was like Canberra, all right? It was a center of false god Venus. It was a basically a sin pit where people wallowed in moral filth. It was a, a filthy place. And here, these three fellas met this false prophet, all right? Their first encounter, and they had some spiritual militants. It was pressure. It, it was um, people who, a person in particular, who tried to um, prohibit the advancement of God's word. And they felt this pressure. He was, a, he was an astrologer, he was a sorcerer, and he consulted the stars. He's an occultist, a, a false prophet. And here, it says here that uh, this man, which, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, all right? He was an, an authoritative figure, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, it was a smart man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. So here's a man that's in political authority that wants to hear the word of God. And this other sidekick here tried to interfere and withstood and tried to withstand the advancement of God's word. And so he said, I want, I want to hear the word of God. I want to hear what you guys have to say. And immediately Satan is threatened. And Satan's agents begin to withstand the truth. And understand, when you reach a soul for Christ, you can be sure that hell will try to hinder what you're doing. I mean, it's, it's not a coincidence. I mean, if you do it, you know door knocking and, and meeting people on the street and passing out tracks and you know things happen if you're aware of what's going on in your surroundings you know whether it's uh, uh somebody's phone rings or something happens to try to disturb that advancement of the gospel it's not a coincidence let me tell you it, it, it's, it's it's the agents of satan trying to withstand the advancement of the truth of god Amen. and so it, it's going to happen it's going to happen in fact in read a verse to you in uh two Timothy in chapter 3, I know we're getting uh, close to the closing down here, 2 Timothy chapter 3, and uh, again, this will give you a little bit of an idea. This is nothing new. It happened back in Moses' time, and uh, Paul references this to Timothy in chapter 3 of 2 Timothy and verse number 8. And uh, it says here, now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. They resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. 
Verse 13, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Tell you what, it's, it's happening in this world today. And I'm dealing with some S, uh, SDAs, Seventh-day Adventists there in Eidsfold, and I had a meeting this past week with uh, the uh, pastor of the church at a place called Gainda. And, uh, you know, this, again, this is all this, I think, born out of my personal experience recently, and the fact that uh, beautiful people, just lovely people, and uh, the pastor, he's in his uh, early 70s, and his wife probably is in his late 60s, and it's very kind, hospitable people. And, but, uh, you know, and I think they mean well, and they're, they're simply deceived, and it, is, it won't go into a lot of that, but I'm fighting that right now. And it, it's simply, in the Christian life, folks, we have to have discernment. Right. Not everything that glitters is gold. And I understand that devil knows he cannot get rid of God's word, so he tries to dilute it and deceive people. And so as you go out uh, letterboxing, door knocking, understand that uh, there's stuff going behind the scenes you can't see. Not to scare you, but to prepare you to understand it's a spiritual battle. It's not just simply handing somebody a gospel track or knocking on the door. It's a spiritual battle going on you don't see in that person's heart. And the devil knows that. And he has agents all across the world just disrupting the advancement of God's word. So you have to be aware of that. Don't be a, We have greater is he that's in you than he does in the world. So now we're on the winning side. We have God's power. We have his, we have his promise of his help to know, but to be aware of that. To be aware that there's going to be spiritual militants, as Paul dealt with here. And he, he did all his life, and so will we all our life. We have this uh, taking place, and there's demonic opposition to the gospel. But don't, don't get stopped before you go. Don't let this stop you. All right? You still got to go. And that makes it even more thrilling to know we can't do that. We can't fight these. We can't fight this spiritual opposition. It must be God and his power to rely on him. So we have, in verse 13, we have um, there the outside attack of Elimaeus, and we have the inside attack of John Mark. Understand, John Mark left. We don't know what happened. And so we have a lot going on here. We have, you know, uh, Paul dealing with this uh, sorcerer, this man trying to understand the truth of God's word they had to say. John Mark bailed. We don't know what happened, if he, if he lost interest, if he got uh, sick, if uh, he just didn't want to travel anymore. We don't know what happened. And, uh, in fact, later on in chapter 15, uh, Paul and Barnabas, they fight about whether or not to take him or not. And so... He, he, here is simply pressure and opposition attacks from all sides. And unfortunately, sometimes the church in its mission is often devastated as much internally as it is externally. And that was going to try us every which way, internal, external, to try to discourage and, and retard and slow down the, uh, the, the mission of God. But then we have, I let will close with this this morning, we'll stop with this and we're about out of time. We have uh, spiritual mastery. And here's a blessing right here. All right, we have spiritual militants, but we have spiritual mastery. And it says there in verse number 12, Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed. Amen. He believed. Yeah. Being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. You understand all that was going on for one soul? Yeah. You understand that? Yeah. There's a lot going on here. And this man at the end, God won. Yeah. And, and the devil lost this man's soul. He believed and was astonished at the doctrine, the teaching, the preaching of the Lord of the Lord. Of Lord. All right, so the spiritual mastery. So you know we're on the winning side. You know the sweetness of victory. And the battle was for the soul of Sergius Paulus. And he believed. And, uh, you know, sometimes uh, that war goes on. And sometimes, to be honest, it doesn't, you know, that person rejects. And person walks away. But that's okay. Because our job is to take the seed, is to take the, the seed of God's word and plant that seed and distribute that seed wherever we go. Right. And uh, but don't be, don't be, uh, don't be feel like you, know, you want to stop before you even go because there's going to be opposition. There's going to be pressure. It's going to, going to be pressed against you. And it's a war. It's a battle. And there always has been, always will be a battle for truth. Right. Always will be until Christ comes back and eliminates everything and uh, sets his kingdom up. And, and uh, you know the story from there. So don't, don't be discouraged, but to be aware that you're going to find, you're going to, it's not going to be uh, a cakewalk, as I say. It's going, to, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be pressured, it's going to be fighting. And uh, these SDA people, again, they're wonderful people, and I was, I was the bad guy for trying to unearth some, some errors. You know, and, and that's, it's, it's so, the devil's so slick. He's so, he's so deceptive. He is so deceptive. And uh, just, you know, rely on the Holy Spirit, His power. And, uh, you know, don't, don't, uh, don't stop before you go. But be aware of the fact that there will be, will be pressure 
and will be opposition when we uh, think about missions and, and emphasizing that in our Christian life and, and to, to, as we go out, and there will be that pressure. All right, Pastor. Amen.